one, and we're live. This is Nifty Culture. I'm Pio. And this evening, I have the pleasure of speaking with actor, writer, director, spoken word artist, multidisciplinary artist, David Bianchi. How's it going, David? Yo, what's up, brother? It's good to see you. I'm happy to be here and great to have a conversation. Last time we had a chat, it was a great conversation. It was so fun. And um, I'm happy that uh, that that what I'm doing warrants another conversation so soon. Absolutely, man. Um, yeah, likewise, really enjoyed our chat last time. Really enjoyed learning about that project last time. And I think we were on maybe the third or the fourth in that series when you came on. Um, and it's great to hear that it's completely sold out and you've got some diamond hand collectors over there on Super Rare. So really excited to talk about this new project. So it's Break the Bars and it's a spoken word spinema, which is a term that you've coined. And I think I think you trademarked it, right? It's like a, it's a David Bianchi trademark, right? Yeah. Um, film. And, and this is directed by you. This is the first spinema film on the blockchain that you've directed. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah, I entered the, and I appreciate the the, the, the glowing intro. Uh, L-A-J-G, let's go! <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I entered the space um, in March 2021. Um, and actually, my first drop was April 2nd with a piece called I Can't Breathe, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And yep. then, um, and, and that piece was the first ever award-winning spoken word film as an NFT. And so that was sort of how I entered the space. So, and then I dropped the second one, um, which was called You Can't Hear Me, starring Malcolm Jamal Warner, um, directed by um, Emmy nominee Christopher Falkins. And that also uh, had a successful auction. We did really well, donated $7,000 to a nonprofit off the back of that. And then with the first one, donated all the proceeds, which is almost $20,000 to the George Floyd Memorial Foundation. Um, and then I ended up doing the Modern Day Minstrel, which we spoke of last time, and, and that sold out. All nine of those sold out to some very sophisticated collectors. And so this is the third Spinema film to ever be minted on the blockchain. So for anyone that doesn't know, Spinema is my trademark, and it stands for Spinning Cinema Through Spoken Word. So what I do is for the last almost 20 years, I've been producing basically high concept short films told entirely in spoken word poetry that are socially conscious in their theme. So I have made the mission to donate to nonprofits that are associated with the themes that my drops are exploring. And so this one uh, is, is called Break the Bars and it's focusing on our inner city youth. Like if you look at that opening shot, the idea of the voyeuristic nature of that shot is that the green is, is untouchable, followed by another layer, which is bars, another layer, which is glass. And then she's behind it with a very blue, sort of opaque, washed out, bleach bypass kind of look. The thing is, the inspiration behind this was that when I was living in Hollywood a long time ago, when I first moved here, I had little cockroaches in the kitchen. I had a torn leather couch. I had no AC. And um, there were bars in every window. And I felt like, are, am I being protected from them or they feel like they're protecting themselves from us? Like it's that sort of like caged environment. And then when I came home one day, I noticed some of the kids in my building were playing in the backyard and that backyard happened to be a dumpster and they were playing handball against a dumpster. And it just broke my heart that these kids had no concept of what was being done to their subconscious as a result of where they were living. So that was the inspiration for fuck the bars, which eventually became break the bars. Uh, <laughs> And so that that's basically what it is. So this is the the first ever one that I've directed, and also as you see, produced and edited, and also co-wrote. Um, and so it's got my fingerprints on every single frame. That's so awesome, man. Um, and it looks like so you act in it as well. Uh, but I, I should have assumed that, obviously, since that's you know your your number one thing. Um, so you know how well, this, when did before you go that I want to say first I'm an artist first. I'm an artist first, no matter what. I painted my first painting when I was in like first grade. My mother still has it framed. You know, I, I, I make money as an actor and as a filmmaker, but it's a job, right? What I do in the NFT space as an artist makes my heart beat. Like this is the stuff that makes me feel alive because the work that I'm creating in the NFT space is changing the world, right? I'm, I'm really helping the human experience. You know, when I'm on Queen of the South or SEAL Team or whatever else, I'm, I know their lines, I hit their marks, and I play for their cameras, and it's an honor to have that kind of job. But I'm an artist first, no matter what, and and as you said, you know, interdisciplinary. So, 
Absolutely. And, and, you know, this, this looks incredibly cool. And the fact that you edited it is incredible, you know, very impressive to me. Um, you know, my creative background is as a music video director. So when I see clean edits like this, I get really excited. You know, when did the production start on this? When did you decide that this was the next project that you were going to work on? You know, cause you just, you had that series that came out on super rare. It feels like not very long ago. It's hard to tell time in the NFT space, but when we last spoke, you know, you were in the throes of that one. How did this one get started? And, and you know how did the production go on this one? Sure. So it's um it's a good question. I, I wrote the piece about God 15 years ago, and I was come and I was performing it at the local slams and the local open mics with my boy Chris Wood there. Uh, shout out to Chris Wood, an incredible poet, incredible actor. And um, you know the production came over a decade and a half later, like long, long time later. But this is a project that I completed that I had in the vault, right? And so. Um, after I realized the success of Spinema in the blockchain, it wasn't necessarily about the idea that I was like, oh, I'm just going to keep minting these things. I wanted to be able to, to talk about subject matter that was more universal, you know, because my first projects were really about, you know, inequality for people of color, injustice, Black Lives Matter sort of themes, you know, vicious racism in America, whereas Break the Bars is sort of a universal theme of let's just do better for our inner city youth. And it's not just an American problem. It's a it's a Bangladesh problem. It's a Korea problem. It's a Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, at infinitum, right? So in general, it's a call to action to do better for our children. So um, to answer the question about production is that it was probably a little bit over a couple of years ago, um, and I've had it in the vault. This played the festival circuit and did really, really well. So some people might say, well, that's kind of cheating. You didn't really produce well. Okay, well, there's a million artists that have rooms stacked full of paintings that are minting them on the blockchain. My paintings just happen to be moving canvases. So when some people are focusing on one frame, I'm focusing on 24 frames a second for five and a half minutes, so I'm dealing with about 8,000 frames. That I'm thinking about. Um, and so, you know, as a result of that, you know, here we are with number three. And now, you know, really excited about the noise that it's making, the way it's being received. And for someone like you, who's an accomplished filmmaker, to see the edits and, and see clean edits and see um, and have admiration for the work, that means a lot to me because spinema as an art form is very challenging, right? You gotta you gotta write poetry that the poets are gonna respect. You got to have performances that the actors will respect and you got to have camera work that the DPs will respect and create a solid story through imagery that directors will respect. So it's a lot. Of, and on top of that, you got to create art that the blockchain will respect. Right. So it's a lot of shoes to fill. Um, but I, I am uniquely qualified as a result of what I've of what, as a result of what I've done over the last two decades. And that's what I was going to say is like, you're, you know, for people that don't know, you're, you're a veteran of the Los Angeles, I mean, not just Los Angeles, just the film industry, right? And so for people that haven't navigated that industry, it's an incredibly competitive, especially at the, in, in the time that you've, you know, participated in it, because if anything, you know, there have been some barriers that have been broken down to some capacity because of the internet and things like that. People are able to get noticed because of YouTube, but you know, the traditional film industry is incredibly difficult to climb the ladder in. Uh, so you being a veteran of that industry, and then now having success in nfts right that the last series the minstrel series sold out totally sold out yeah, um, well, you know five I sold, I sold each piece i literally get this this was crazy because i dropped the first one july 1st september 1st the last one dropped so nine nfts sold in eight and a half weeks which is on average Literally, they lasted on average seven days each on the marketplace before selling. So, uh, yeah, so that's incredible. A fully sold out series of one of ones on Super Rare, your first Super Rare series, right? Or, or that was after I Can't Breathe. Was I Can't Breathe also on Super Rare? Well, I Can't Breathe and You Can't, I Can't Breathe was on Ephemera. Um, and then You Can't Hear Me was on Ephemera and Obtainable. So I did the limited editions on Obtainable and then the film on Ephemera. But this was my first super rare drop. My first, it was my genesis on super rare. 
Awesome. And so, you know, at this point you have a real track record, right? Like I think undoubtedly this is this is going to sell. Like it's not going to just sit there, right? Someone's going to buy this. So at that point you really have this like kind of body of work in the NFT space. I'm wondering, do your contemporaries in the film industry in the entertainment industry, do they really understand what's going on? Have they been asking you questions about it? Like I'd love to know what people that are just firmly in that industry and outside of the NFT space think of what you've been doing. Well, it's a great question, man. You know, the thing is, um, I, in the beginning of this, I really leaned on Hollywood for help. Like I was like, Hey, can you help me with some PR, help me amplify this? And people in Hollywood are just like, NF what? NF who? Like they just don't know. They don't get it. Right. And so, um, everything that I've cultivated, I've cultivated from the inside and people in some people, some pundits in the NFT space may say, well, David's a celebrity. He's an actor. Well, no, not really, because none of my following in Hollywood has helped my career in the NFT space. Right. Because I can go to the mountaintops of Hollywood and shout NFTs and it sounds like Greek. You know, I, I had to come into the NFT community with an open heart honest intentions, really, really good art and develop relationships from the ground up. Right. So, you know, now what I'm doing in the NFT space is starting to make so much noise that to your point, Hollywood is starting to get a little, almost like kind of by curious, <laughs> like you're starting to be like, damn, he's really like doing something. I don't know what he's doing. I just don't get it. And then the whole metaverse thing that we'll talk about that really sort of like, you know, has popped the top a little bit because now it's not just fine art, as it were, with the minstrel show. It's now film in the virtual space, which has got people really curious. So I have very, very, I have very big plans for what I want to do in crypto art and the metaverse um, and media, et cetera. So this is really only the beginning for me. I, I totally believe that. And so, you know, we talked a little off air and you just mentioned it, the red carpet premiere of the film. And I'm on your Twitter right now. Uh, I'm going to pull up some footage of it. Can, but can you talk about this? What we think is the first film premiere in the history of like the in history, the first film premiere in the metaverse, correct? Yeah, we're talking. We're not talking about crypto voxels or Decentraland or the sandbox. We're talking about all of the metaverse. And this was actually verified by the founders of Decentraland um, of the Decentraland Foundation, because this was a collaboration between my company, Exertion Films, Maker's Place, and the Decentraland Foundation. The what I asked them, to, what I asked Maker's Place to do in the beginning, I was like, "Hey, can we show this in your gallery? Because you guys have a gallery. Could we do that?" And you know, Aisha was so cool. She says, "I mean, we have the capabilities. We can try." Why not? Yeah, there's a little sizzle right there. Um, yeah, we can try. And then it basically turned into, you know, conversations and conversations and development. And what ultimately ended up happening was the develop the development team at Decentraland ended up literally like completely restructuring the entire Maker's Place gallery and converting it into a red carpet screening room experience. Here we go. I just got the audio going. But yeah, so a red carpet. So, I mean, there is, we, we drew almost 275 people to the first ever red carpet film premiere in the metaverse. And what was great about this, so Category 5 came out and DJed, um, you know, Lostrum, shout out to them. And so many great people jumped in to make this a, a, successful, a successful experience. So you came on the red carpet and then there's category five DJing. And then when you broke the threshold of the theater, the music stopped, the curtains opened, and then the film began to play. So it's just mind blowing. It was literally like ready player one in real time. <laughs> you know? it's really it, it looks wild. Yeah. I mean, it's such a cool way to premiere a film, right? And it's such a cool way to um, enable participation from supporters and fans of the film where, you know, if you go to a red carpet premiere in LA, you know, I, I don't even know if they'll like how many people they'll let you, you know, bring if you get a plus one or if you get several people, right? But this is like an in inclusive way to get people involved in that same premiere, the same premiere that you're going to the creator of the film with a DJ, with a host. Um, so it's really exciting to me. And it hadn't even like crossed my mind that that hadn't been done and that that's something that people can do. So I do think it's an innovative approach to, to you know, blockchain filmmaking. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm so grateful for it. And, um, you know, I, I love it. JG's got the head mind blown emojis. And, and uh, honestly, Jay, I was mind blown too, to be quite honest. Um, but yeah, man, it's, it's, it has set a precedent, right? Nobody ran the four minute mile until someone ran the four minute mile, right? Yep. So now there's a precedent for this being able to happen. And the design, the creativity that went into building out this architecture as far as the metaverse is concerned is really bar none and not only did this happen it's actually a, a solo exhibit at the maker's place gallery in for the indefinite future so anybody that's out there right now you could literally go to decentraland right now and you can go to the maker's place gallery and you will have that experience you could walk the red carpet you could walk in there the curtains will open and you could watch break the bars in its entirety and as soon as the first version of the film ends a second version of the film starts which is director commentary so you get to hear me speaking through the film talking about director notes color temperature camera choices you know psychology wardrobe editorial choices etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so for me, it was just like an incredibly immersive experience, you know, and like people were able to take pictures with me on the red carpet and I took pictures with them. And, and speaking of community, I've made the promise that anybody that shows up that gets a Pope, cause we also did a uh, proof of attendance protocols. So yep. anybody that got a Pope got automatic entry into a raffle to receive a limited edition NFT from the drop. And yep. so, so we did a Twitter competition, breaking the bars. Uh, so if you do hashtag breaking the bars, red carpet, you'll see a bunch of pictures from the red carpet. It's great. And so we're going to announce the winners of that. And then also, um, we also did uh, so most inventive red carpet picture. And then just for attendance. So we're giving away two NFTs just for people attending. I mean, it's so cool. And, and, you know, bringing the, the proof of attendance protocol factor into it, and we're seeing that more and more with people, even on Twitter spaces. And, um, you know, it's, it's becoming a pretty, uh, in demand thing. It's almost expected at this point. I think that that adds to this. And that's also something that I think will spill into like traditional industry, like actual red, you know, in, in real life, red carpet premieres in the future. Like, I think we could see that. So, you know, w with this film, it, w when is it dropping? People, can, where can people find it? Can you kind of give us an idea of, of, you know, those kind of those factors? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the, the auction started on the 24th. So if you go to make, go to Maker's Place and you search David Bianchi, you'll find it. But the best way to do that is uh, if you go to my Twitter handle, the there's a pinned, a pinned link on my, a pinned link on my Twitter that will take you to the drop page. And so the drop page is is somewhat unique in that the entire film is being auctioned as a one of one. So let me break that down a little bit. Not only is it being auctioned as a one of one, it's actually 500 megabytes on chain. So it's a five and a half minute film at about 12 megabytes per second on the bit rate at 1920 by 1080. So you're basically getting a pretty lossless file at just under 2K on chain, which is like, boom, okay, JG, give me some more <laughs> the brain fucking exploding, right? Um, <laughs> you know, which is why it made sense for this film to premiere because it's minted as a one of one NFT. So now, knowing that whales are going to buy, are going to be bidding on that, Pranksy put in the first bid, um, knowing that buyer, lar larger scale buyers are going to get that, I wanted to make something that's community driven and something that's community based. I want people that can't afford to ape in to be able to have access to the work. So I also did an open edition of basically an augmented reality style poster that has Sarah's voice under it and the child chimes and then her handwriting superimposing over the poster. And I sold those for 0.08 ETH, right? And we sold those out. So we did about 30 of those. And then the next step up, these beautiful limited edition pieces, there's about six out of 12 left. So three ones of fours. And I extracted specific stills from the film. We, embell we embellished them in After Effects and created camera moves within them. And then you have the soundscape of the film beneath them. So they're sort of standalone NFTs, and um, and those are point four. So I didn't want to break anybody's bank, you know. I just wanted yep. to make it accessible to people. Um, and now that it's become a bit of a historic film, you know, I think it's exciting that I can broaden the collective base. Because like with the minstrel, the majority of people that were inspired by my work got priced out, right? right. Not every, you know, because for the common person in the ecosystem, spending three, four, five ETH, six ETH. Yep. On a one of one is a lot of money, you know. 
Yep. Um, especially because my, you know, fine art, as you know, PO is more store value. It's not like, you know, buying a cool cat at six and flipping it at nine and it's, kind <laughs> of, and it's super liquid, right? Fine art is not as liquid as the PFP projects. So um, it takes, it's a certain kind of collector as it were. But that, but that's cool that you're able to get other pieces into collector's hands, you know, in a few different ways, it sounds like. So that kind of, you know, it expands the base. You know, what can you tell me about like the community that you've been building? Because I see you in Twitter spaces. I see you active, you know, on the different platforms. What, what can you talk about, like, you know, with the community that you've been a part of and the community that you've been building since you've gotten into the NFT space? Sure. Um well, I have to give a big shout out to guys like uh, like Farouk, um, who has always been a supporter of my work since day one. Uh, guys like Paulo Moreno, who were some of the early, some of the rock stars that were in Clubhouse at the time, and um, you know, God rest his heart, you know, uh, Wolf Lion Jin, um, really really strong style supporters of my work, and so they sort of opened up the mushroom for me, as it were. And then recently, my community has been much more um, philanthropic. Um, and high art sort of driven communities um, because the work that I create, it's nonprofit oriented, it's socially conscious. And I think I'm really finding um, um, a broader community of people that are interested in social impact rather than just, you know, Bitcoins and lollipops or whatever, <laughs> or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever creatures or crocodiles or frogs or whatever animal is being minted. And, in randomized drops, which I have, which I love. I love randomized. <laughs> I love them. They're, they're a great way to have, you know, high value assets and flip and make money and it's fun. Um, but my, my lane is high art. Right. And that's a different lane. And, and like you said, that's like a different investment as well. Correct. And I, you know, and for as small as our community is, it, it does have its quadrants, right? There are people that are like, look, I'm not into PFPs. I love generative art. I love AI art. I love art block stuff, right? Uh, there are some people that are like, I don't buy in the aftermarket. I only mint. I'm real shishi. Okay, cool. And then there's other artists and there's other collectors that are like, you know, I'm I'm kind of into the the avatar thing, but I'm a fine artist guy. I'm a, you know, I'm a one of one guy. Some people won't buy limited editions. So, you know, I'm finding different, really interesting pockets of our ecosystem. And uh, the more friends I make, the more inspired I get, you know, I, uh, and I concede that there is a certain kind of collector that is going to be drawn to what I'm doing. And there's going to be other collectors that are going to be like, wow, what you're doing is incredible, but it's just not for me. And that's okay. And you get that understanding from participation and time in the space. And so any artists that are listening, any, anyone that's coming from a traditional industry like the music industry or the film industry um, can, I think, take cues from you that you have to participate. You have to dive in. Uh, the NFT space isn't like a, you know, a side way to make some extra dough, right? Because at the end of the day, like if you don't stick around, if you're not participating, then the value of your work, it's, it's unlikely that the value of your work will increase over time. And then that's just something that'll hurt your reputation. So I watched the way that you've been operating and, you know, it's definitely inspiring for me too. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess wh where can people find you, David? I know I have your Twitter handle right there at David Bianchi. Um, I'm assuming the same on Instagram. Where else can people find you? I mean, you could just, you could, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't break the law anymore, dog. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, uh, I'm pretty easy to find. And I try to be really accessible. Like, you know, I, um, I also, you know, have a mindset of each one, teach one. And uh, so much information was freely given to me about, the, about how to maneuver in the, in the NFT space. And so I oftentimes, I'm on clubhouses. I spent you know, two hours, you know, speaking in a clubhouse room where there was, you know, 25 people. And that's okay. Because there were people that did that when I was sitting in the audience trying to figure out my way in the NFT space. So where do, what does it mean for me as a Hollywood person, NFT person, artist? What does that mean? What it means is, as long as it feeds my spirit, I'm the one that's got to sleep at night, you know? And I really believe that the intersection of Hollywood is creating a new Hollywood in the metaverse. You know, um, what I basically did is a case study, right? And so what Ashton Kutcher has done is a case study, created stoner cats and raised a bunch of money. And then if you own an NFT, you get to watch the episodes. 
some people will argue there were successes and failures about that drop. I think it was a success because they made money and it's a case study. You know, my work is a case study for where uh, media and film consumption will exist as it relates to the metaverse and the blockchain. Because my vision is that the future of NFTs, I really believe, is long form. Now, there'll always be a home, I think, for short form and standalone still frames and NFT photography and all that. But I, I think that long term, uh, long form is going to be it. I mean, even like look at like Jose Delbo, who did like a nine minute like cinema render piece on Maker's Place. Um, more and more, I think that white collar collectors, white glove collectors, unless you're dealing with an artist with tons of provenance like Beeple or X Copy, right? are going to be saying, well, I could spend 20 ETH on a David Bianchi Spinema film, right? Or I could spend 20 ETH on a, you know, a, a 10 second motion JPEG, as it were. And depending on what the collector wants, if it's a coming around to showcasing, they may be interested in the longer form. There's more, you know, people like to, I think, invest in things that they believe has more labor into it, right? When you look at a beautiful 40 render, 40 cinema render piece, you're just like, fuck, that took forever. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, it took forever. And so that's why, I'm, and you see the meticulousness in it. And when you watch Break the Bars or any of my cinema pieces, you see the meticulous nature of my work and you know, it didn't happen overnight. I think that goes without saying, um, you know, everyone definitely check out David's work, his series on super rare that sold out. You might be priced out of that because his collectors have diamond hands, but if you're a whale and you're listening, you can definitely try to strike a deal. Um, this is, <laughs> this is something you can still buy. This is the break the bars NFT project on maker's place. The auction is going on right now. David's easy to find. He's not hiding David Bianchi on all social platforms. David, thanks so much for joining us, man. Yo, know, it's, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I love seeing your face and having a laugh with you, man. Thank you so much. <laughs> Likewise, man. See you, everybody.